<laughs> Welcome to my talk, <laughs> where I will share the, my adventures <laughs> with the 3D features of Godot. Short introduction. My name is Pavel. I've been coding for 17 years, commercially for about seven. I've always have a, had a passion for computer games, but last year I decided to do something about it and set up a company called Miskatonic Studio. And I started working on the first game, Intrepid. Intrepid is a computer version of an escape room game. And I picked this project for two reasons. One is that it is based on, a, on the exact same script that my girlfriend and I prepared for a real life escape room for her birthday party. Uh, so we had a lot of fun making that room. Our friends had a lot of fun trying to escape, although no one did. Uh, so it had sentimental value for me and that really helped me to not quit the projects. Uh, and sometimes it was really hard not to quit. Uh, the other reason was uh, that it is a very small game, uh, the, the scope is very small, uh, there are no enemies, no AI, no physics, no jumping, no crouching, the area is rather limited, so it was the, per the perfect first game. Uh, but it had to be 3D, I knew that from the beginning, because with a 3D game you feel like, like you are inside of the game, but with a two-dimensional game you feel like you are observing the game. And I really wanted uh, people to feel like they are on that spaceship trying to escape. So I took a look at what's available in terms of 3D uh, engines and there are many available. And some of them are expensive, some of them are crap, some of them are old and no longer supported. And it was difficult to pick one, but I narrowed it down to three options. One was Panda 3D because it uses Python and I code in Python on a daily basis so I could use that skill. Uh, the other one was Unity because Unity is everywhere, it's very popular. And then there was Godot, which is open source, and that's an, ad uh, uh, an, advantage, an advantage for me, because I like open source software. Uh, Panda was out as soon as I tried to export anything, because they have a whole page in the documentation uh, saying how to export a game, and none of that stuff works. Uh, so if, if a game engine cannot export a game, then what good is it? Uh, of course, I could like spend a week trying to fix it, but what for? Uh, Unity is very popular. It has a huge community and many games but it doesn't have an editor that works on Linux. And I know it might not be a problem for many of you, but I don't have Windows at the moment, I'm working on it. But I didn't have it when I started working on Intrepid, so I have to uh, reorganize my entire development environment just to install Unity. So that was out too, and I was stuck with Godot. <laughs> and then I recall that a few years ago, I downloaded Godot, nothing serious, I just wanted to check uh, what, how it works, what it does and uh, the download size was very small, which is uh, a good thing. It worked on Windows, Linux, Mac, so that's also a huge advantage. There were no uh, licenses like pay extra to remove the splash screen thing, so that's also nice. Uh, the tutorial was a Pong game. I mean, come on, you can do better. And I think at some point the tutorial told me to implement uh, collision detection on my own. And it's not very difficult, but uh, that's something that a game uh, engine should handle uh, out of the box. So if it doesn't, then again, what good is it? So the first impression was Godot is not brilliant. Uh, but now when I downloaded the Godot, oh, well, I say now, but it was like half a year ago, uh, it looked much better. The uh, website contains some 3D examples as if uh, Godot creators are trying to tell me, yes, this engine can be used for 3D games, which was very reassuring for someone who wanted to use it for a 3D game. Uh, the tutorial was much more interesting. Uh, the collisions worked out of the box this time. You just had to like connect a signal, very nice. So uh, it looked much better and very promising. But was it good enough for a 3D game? Let's see. First thing that comes to mind when working with uh, 3D games is importing models into the game engine. In my case, models were, cre were created in uh, Blender. Uh, that mostly worked. Uh, Blender has a built-in exporter for uh, working with uh, Godot for, with, for the Colada format. There are also other uh, more sophisticated exporters available as Blender plugins. Uh, the 3D artist I work, worked with uh, used the built-in exporter and most of the times it was okay. Uh, when I imported the models, the materials were created automatically. I just had to fill in the textures by hand. But I've been told that's how the industry works, so I'm not complaining. There is no support for DDS and TIFF uh, textures, so that might that, that was not a huge problem for a small game like Intrepid. Shall we run away or? Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> 
So uh, that was not a problem for a small game like Intrepid, but it might be a problem for a bigger game. Uh, there was a small issue with saving materials. When I modified the material and pressed Control S, it wouldn't always save, and it took me. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought someone would say something like that. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, yeah, but uh, the, the solution was to use the save button in the inspector. That always worked. Yeah, so uh, yeah, ju just a minor issue, and it's fixed. So great. Uh, I was surprised by how easy it was to import the camera animation into Godot. Uh, like uh, I think it was a follow path animation in Blender, and nothing went wrong when I tried to uh, play it in Godot. Uh, it was the exact same animation, no problems. And switching from the animated camera to a to the player's head camera was also seamless, so that was great. Uh, there was occasionally an issue with scaling. Could you show the first image of this? Oh, this one, yeah. Could you sp press space or not now? Uh, one uh, arrow, please. Yeah, this one. Uh, this is the correct size model. This is the incorrect, this is the model that I just imported. Uh, sometimes there was uh, probably an issue with exporting the models. Uh, it might have something to do with the workflow that my 3D artist used, but uh, I have seen those exporters and there are many options and some of them I would argue are set to incorrect default values and uh, some of them are easy to miss. So I think that it, it, should, they, it would be worth to put some work into simplifying those exporters so that people who don't work with Godot don't, don't have to, to worry much about exporting them correctly. One thing that was very bad was the armature modifier from Blender. Uh, I Could you uh, switch the image? Uh, yeah, uh, this one. Uh, every time I tried to export a model with an armature modifier, something would go wrong. Either I would, the, the model was misaligned, as in this case you can see the cryopod door not aligning with the cryopod, or the whole model would be animated instead of just part of it, or, the, or nothing was animated at all, or I would get a bug when exporting uh, the model so that was horrible and eventually I had to just copy the animation from Blender to Godot by hand but that was not a huge problem because the animation player node works very nicely uh, so so it, it wasn't a lot of effort but it's, it was an extra step that I shouldn't have to take okay another thing that I was really worried about was performance because there aren't many 3d games in Godot available like uh, 3d first person games uh, so maybe because the performance is not good enough, maybe that, that's what keeps people from making uh, first-person games in Godot. Uh, so to check it, I downloaded this 3D FTP interaction template. You can just select it when you open the Godot window and then, then go to template. And I got a wonderful seven frames per second, which is horrible for a game. And so I was really worried about performance, but when I started working on the game, uh, I started adding more models into it, uh, the performance was actually quite okay. Could you switch that? Uh, yeah, I would usually get around 25 frames per second, less if I try to uh, use the more advanced effects like glow or reflections. But yeah, my laptop is not a very powerful one. One thing that I learned uh, uh, when working on a game that I need more powerful hardware. Uh, uh, the, tr the trick was to enable multi-threads. Uh, you go to project settings, thread model, and set it to multi-threaded, and that makes a huge difference in terms of performance of uh, how, how many frames per second you get. So the performance was quite good for a simple game like this. Uh, however, uh, something that even a simple game like this could use was clip planes. From what I understand, these are planes that the game engine first checks if they are rendered at all on the screen, and if they are not rendered, then all the models associated with them are also not rendered, which improves performance significantly. And I couldn't find anything like that in Godot, so eventually I had to, uh, I had to like first load just the first room of the game, and then when the uh, intro animation was done, I would load the rest of the spaceship. Uh, yeah, so that also not a huge problem for a small game, but it might might be something for other people to uh, to change. Okay, Lightning in Godot, uh, according to the com documentation, Godot combines uh, the advantages of uh, forward and deferred lightning. It doesn't really say how many light sources are available at, at a given moment. For me, it was about five light sources, more than that, and they would start flickering. Again, this is not a powerful machine. 
uh, so the solution was to use the area. So, so, so even for uh, for a small game like Imperfect, I had to somehow disable the lights that are not used at the moment. Lucky for me, the area node is exactly uh, is working perfectly. Is uh, exactly as I would expect it, so that was uh, a perfect solution to this problem. I would just uh, turn off the lights when the player left the room. Uh, it's very nice that Godot has shadows that work out, work out of the box. You just have to uh, select, you have to remember to select shadows both for the model and for the light source. And uh, when you do, they just work. You have free quality settings in the project settings. I think they are called shadow filtering or something. Uh, and that works and it's very nice. Uh, you, you don't have to do anything except for enabling it. Uh, there are small issues. Could you pause the presentation? And I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, okay, you can see it here. Uh, but I even though this, this edge is completely uh, smooth, the, um, yeah, I didn't expect the, the room to be so <laughs> lightly, brightly light. Um, So it's not the light, it's the resolution probably. And you, you might see that the, the edges are not always even, uh, even if the surface is smooth. Uh, also, could you switch that? Also, there is a setting con called contact uh, that by default creates this weird effect. Here is a wall and on that wall is a console which ends here. And the shadow starts a bit further than that. So. Uh, by default, it looks like the, the shadow is not touching the object that is casting the shadow, even if the object is on the plane where the cut, uh, shadow is cast on. Uh, and that is especially visible here and when the pipes were touching the walls. Uh, but th these are like small things that you, you have to, uh, at least in my opinion, you have to actively start looking for uh, in the game because the general impression when I enabled the shadows, the general, general impression was very good. Like, considering how much work I had to do, that is enabling the shadows and uh, uh, in lightning and in the model, uh, the effect was really, really nice. And uh, only when I started looking for issues, I would, I would find them. So that is mostly okay. One thing that Godot is really bad at is transparency. Uh, I don't have experience with other game engines, so maybe they are bad at transparency too. I would expect them to be, uh, but yeah, I, I'm, saying what my experience was when working with this feature. Uh, so there are two ways you can handle transparency uh, with materials. You can either use the alpha channel from the albedo texture, or you can use a separate alpha texture that will be later merged by the engine with the uh, color texture. Uh, Godot uses the first option, which is, well, one of two options, so that's okay. But the side effect is that you can only use 8-bit uh, uh, PNG files, because from what I know, 16-bit uh, PNG files do not support transparency. So uh, the side effect was that transparent objects had, had to use textures of worse quality than the non-transparent objects, which is not a big issue for this game, uh, but it could be an issue for, uh, for someone who wants to like, make real money on, on a computer game. Uh, there was a big issue with objects with transparent, ma transparent materials not being rendered correctly. Could you pause right now? Uh, here, uh, the, the issue occurred when the object with a transparent material was seen through another object with a transparent material and in that case the first object was not rendered at all. Here is the inner window in the corridor and then there is an outer window in the spaceship hull and that outer window was part of the larger model that also included parts of, the, of that hull and when I would stand in the corridor and look outside then I would see these huge gaps that you can see here. Uh, I've submitted the bug on GitHub and the response was that this is a limitation of the rendering algorithm and then they, there's nothing they can do at the moment with that. Uh, all right. Uh, I mean, th that is very, very likely because 3D has a lot of weird limitations that people have no idea about until they start actually working on them. Uh, but this was a huge problem for me because I really needed both windows to be transparent and I couldn't let it look like this. Uh, the solution suggested in the documentation is to limit the transparent objects to a minimum. So if you have a wall with a window and the window has to be transparent but the wall doesn't, uh, separate the window, apply a transparent material just to the window and apply a non-transparent material to the wall. So here I just, um, eventually I just removed the outer windows because they were not bringing any value and 
the, the space outside looked much better when you, you, you could observe it without any windows. Uh, there, is a, there was another uh, example of this issue when I, had, when I tried to use a transparent uh, sprite of a human being outline that was inside of a cryopod with a transparent door. I couldn't find uh, an image anywhere. I, I'm pretty sure I took a screenshot, but I probably lost it somewhere. Uh, it created a lot of weird artifacts. So to solve that, I eventually had to use a 3D, a very simple 3D model of a human, human being that was uh, inside of the cryopod so that you, uh, I, I wouldn't have to deal with double transparency in issue. Uh, there is also a nice uh, feature, but a bit unpredictable. Could you switch the slide? Godot supports refraction, which creates a really nice effect Okay, and yeah, the whole game is rather dark, but uh, I, I didn't expect this to not be, to look like this on, on, the, uh, on the talk. Uh, so there is a human being <laughs> inside here uh, that, uh, and the, the transparent door is, uh, has a refraction set enabled, but set to zero. And everything lo looks nice, and I would say that it looks better with, without the with the refraction disabled. So I, I would keep, I would keep the refraction on, but when I try to uh, change the refraction to anything less than zero, could you switch the slide if that's screen uh, You might, if you look really closely, you might notice that the, this, the head is now here. Even though you look directly at it, everything moved to the left. I think that if you look directly at, at the uh, transparent surface with refraction, there should not, not be any movement sideways. In this case, everything inside was moved to the left. So when you stood right in front of the cryopod, you would see the human being like moved to the left and everything inside also moved to the left. And that was weird. Uh, maybe it had something to do with how the textures were uh, unwrapped on a, uh, uh, how the model was unwrapped on a uh, texture. I'm not sure. I know I didn't have time to investigate this because the, uh, I had to release the game. So eventually I just kept the refraction on with the setting uh, set to zero. Okay, a good thing in Godot is the environment. Uh, it has a lot of useful features and most of them work out of the box. I really like the fact that by default you get a sky that has a light source and the distinction be between up and down. So when you start working, you have to do absolutely nothing to like get a up and down difference uh, instead of like having a, the same color everywhere. So that's nice. Uh, it is a bit under-documented, I would say. Uh, m many, many features are not properly described, so we have to like, fig figure them out yourself. Uh, there is also an option to apply a sky texture, which is perfect for a game set in space where you want nebulas and stars all, all around you. So that was very nice. And you can uh, modify the uh, emission uh, lightning, I mean, the, the strength of the emission of, of that texture to get a brighter sky or, or not as bright sky. However, if you would just uh, next, oh yeah, so stop here, please. Yeah, and that, that creates these beautiful effects on uh, surfaces when when the uh, sky is reflected. In, in this case, on the window, and I really like that. However, that sky completely ignores any any object that should cast shadow. Could you switch the next? Yeah. So uh, again, <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, that, that's a good example. Uh, so right, right here, some of these should cast shadows on well, one of the subjects should cast shadow on the other one, but nothing like that happens. Both of them reflect the same thing. So uh, it would, uh, I would get a beautiful sky reflection on a side on the cryopod right next to a, uh, a wall where where the light could not reach it. But yeah, that's that's how it works. Um, so. Eventually, I had to implement a sky cube, unshaded sky cube, and put six different textures on it, uh, which was really annoying because this feature was perfect for this game, uh, and I really wanted to use it, but it, I, because of well, this one thing, I, I couldn't. Because as soon as I uh, uh, set the emission to zero, the sky would go black. And if I set it to anything but zero, I would get reflections everywhere. So a perfect solution would be to like enable color without emission, but that, that was not implemented. Uh, however, could you switch? Uh, other features include glow and reflections, and they work perfectly in Godot. I mean, well, not perfectly, but very, very well uh, in terms of you, you have to do practically nothing to enable them, and they look really good. Here you can see the glow al around the lamps and the reflections on the floor and reflections on the wall here. And all you have to do is just like go to environment and 
enable that in the uh, enable that setting and m well for globe you can choose several different uh, levels and s similar for for reflections but apart from that all you have to do is just enable it and it works and please switch to the next one yeah and here you get the blue reflections of the light uh, of, the, of the lamp on the wall a white reflection on the floor and glow a uh, red glow around the screen and white, white glow around the lamps uh, it really added a lot to the visual side of the game there is also is a setting called depth of field in the environment i would actually i think uh, i would expect it to be in the camera but it was in the environment and the thing uh, and it allows you to create a blur either near the camera or far away from it which was perfect for this game because i wanted to create an effect that you cannot focus your vision after waking up from a cryo sleep and that can be very easily uh, modified programmatically so i would just use random intervals to set this depth of field uh, setting to different values and that created an effect that you, you just woke up and you're kind of blurry. Uh, there was also an auto exposure feature. Uh, no, that, that's again the blur, but yeah, that, 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 that's all just on this side. Uh, there was an auto exposure feature that I wanted to use, but it turned out to be a bit tricky in a closed environment with lots of lamps, so eventually I had to drop it. One last thing for a 3D game that a problem that I encountered uh, was the cursor. As you know, there are four different uh, mouse modes in uh, Godot. Out of them, uh, the capture mode is the most useful for a 3D game because you want to look around uh, like anywhere. And there is also a custom cursor setting, so setting which allows you to replace this default arrow by something more interesting. Which is nice, but I, no, no big deal. I would expect a game engine to have a feature like that. However, if you uh, set a custom cursor, then you go to capture mode, then you move the mouse, and then you go to, let's say, visible mode, then the custom cursor setting is reset, and you get this default arrow. Uh, I mean, it's not reset would not be really a problem, because then you could like set it again, but it's just completely ignored from now on. If you don't move the mouse in capture mode, it works. but. Uh, if you go to capture mode, it's usually because you want to look around. Uh, so uh, ev eventually, uh, well, I submitted the bug again, and er the response was, this should be fixed in Godot 3.1. But when I started working on the game, 3.1 was not available. I had to work with 3.0.6. So mm, eventually I had to implement my own texture rec, uh, my own custom cursor using a texture rec, which is not a big deal, but it's, again, I would really expect this to work out of the box, and it didn't, so I had to take some extra steps. Oh, and also, it took me a really long time to pinpoint this bug because uh, I really didn't know, know what's going on and why it's it's not going uh, going the way it expe uh, I expected it to be. Okay, that will be all for now. Uh, I had a ton of fun working on this game and a lot of fun working with Godot. Uh, I would like to thank all the people who helped me develop the game, people who are developing the game engine, and people who developed Godot slides used for this presentation. Uh, you can download the slides from GitHub, or you can just run the presentation directly from the website. The, this is the presentation. Uh, also, side note, uh, Intrepid, as of last week, is in public domain, so we can do whatever you want, both with the code and with the resources. I will try to upload the blend files soon, but I would like to like uh, sort them out first. Uh, yeah, so thank you for your attention. <laughs> Question? Oh, uh, the question was which exporter my artist used for uh, blend for Blender. Uh, there is a default one in God, uh, in Blender. I think it's just uh, I think it's just Colada exporter or yeah. DA exporter. Uh, not not there, I know there is a plugin, and I w when I uh, tried the engine out, I would use the uh, external plugin. But and I told my artist about it, but he uh, used the default one, and yeah, m mostly it was okay. When I encountered problems with the armature modifier, first thing I w what I tried was to uh, export the model on my own using this plugin exporter, and it also didn't work. Um, maybe we can sh show me after the presentation how to do it. <laughs> Yeah? 
Uh, the question is uh, how, uh, what, ha what happens what happens if you? Uh, well, there are. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so the question is, what happened? I'm repeating that. Uh, what happened when I uh, switched the Pred model, and what changes did I have to make to the game? Right. Yeah. So uh, what happened was that uh, the game w would run much faster, and my uh, laptop would get much more uh, noisy. Uh, because uh, all, all of the cores were involved from now on and uh, that was all I wanted to achieve and I have had to make absolutely no other changes to the game itself. I mean Godot usually uh, shows some warnings on, on the, in the debugger window but I've learned to ignore some of them and I think uh, it extended to ignoring all of them unless the program crashes uh, which is probably not a good habit, I will work on that. Uh, uh, apart, uh, I didn't have to make any changes in the game logic itself. There are three options available. There is a single thread, single thread unsafe, I believe, and then the multi-thread. And uh, yeah, I, I think I also didn't find anything in the documentation, or ju I just was so happy to find this multi-thread option that I didn't read the documentation. I'm not sure. It was quite a long time ago. Uh, so I, but I didn't have to like adjust the game to work with multi. Yeah, exactly, and that was r really nice because like I was worried that why, why I mean my my laptop is not a very powerful machine, but I did run like first person uh, games on it before. So why is Intrepid like having twelve frames per second? Maybe that because uh, it's not using all of the cores. I, I checked it in the, uh, the process manager, and yes, it was using just one core. So I started looking for multi multiple threads, and there, there, there it was that there was the option to, to use all of them, and it just worked. So at least for this game, there were absolutely no other problems uh, with, with this with this setting. I didn't have to like uh, suddenly implement uh, locks on, on critical parts of code. No, nothing like that. It just worked. Oh. Yeah, so the chat asks, how will this uh, site transition perform on a mobile device without the need for software to be used? Like I, have <laughs> no. right. I have absolutely no idea. Okay. I mean, the, the uh, code is available. They can just export it to, to a mobile device and try for themselves. Thank you.